afternoon, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Speaking Legally, where the legal meets the cultural with Edward Pachado, Esquire, and Royce Russell Esquire, and myself, Dr. Stacey N.C. Grant, as your host. So we appreciate that you've been tuning in, you've been commenting, you've been sharing, continue to do that and let folks know this is their place to get the information that impacts our community, especially in times like these. So we have a lot to go through in today's show, but we'll start first with both of our co-hosts giving you some greetings. So Edward Picado, Esquire, over to you. Hola, hola, welcome, hello. This is Ed Pichado. Um, I welcome you today to our show, uh, Speaking Legally, where the law meets culture head on. So we're ready. We got some good topics here today to discuss. And I'm going to hand it over to you, Royce, for your introduction. What's up, everybody? Uh, um, here we are again, tackling the issues at hand. I will tell you that you're going to have to pay real attention to this segment because the information may not be as juicy as who hit who, when, where, and why a little bit more tactical and strategic as to what is really happening today and what headlines might be saying and what reality is actually happening day to day. So with that said, I think last week we talked about the funding or we at least gave a tease about that. We would talk about the funding and how NYPD, the fund NYPD is such a catchy slogan everybody's walking around saying it but what does it really mean it, uh, is there teeth in the uh in the dog's bite or does the dog wear dentures or the dog toothless you know we need to figure it out so hey why don't you hit us off with some of the facts but it's fact or fiction okay well um as some of you may be aware um you know new york city is one of the largest cities on the planet and so thus it has a very large budget. Um, in fact, um, New York City put out a budget last week that amounted to uh, $88.19 billion. And so, um, you know, the reason that's important because, you know, there's been this discussion about defunding the New York City Police Department and the mayor claimed, claims to have done that and the city council in their budget and not everybody's convinced that that's actually what took place. Now, I'm gonna hit on a couple of these points. Now, according to you know what's been reported, uh, school safety officers have been moved from the NYPD to the Department of Education. So that removes $307.1 million from the NYPD's direct budget, you know, because part of their budget was to pay and or fund these school safety officers who service security inside of the public school. And you can, I you, can I ask you one question? One question. Yeah. And and when you go through your points, I may just kind of jump in here because is that defunding? I'm not really sure it is because um, at the end of the day, um, you know, they, they wear the uniform, you know, but yeah. You know, are they considered part of that uh, core force? Was this something that the NYPD was comfortable with, you know, um, letting go of? You know, that's that's the debate here. I know a lot of people feel that the whole idea of having these officers at the entrance of these schools kind of contributes to that pipeline, that prison pipeline, school to prison pipeline thought process you know having to go through the metal detectors so you know i'm you know i'm not sure about that um i'll, I'll leave that for others to debate and discuss I well, mean, I, 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 I'm, I'm sorry get it, all right the reason why i bring that up is because the lay person term defunding means that there's the taking away of something right there is we're not going to give you more of this we're going to remove it we're going to take it away from you and this doesn't seem like a one for one takeaway this just seems like you know almost like the uh electric slide slide to the left slide to the right you know you, you, you know royce i'm going to mention something real quick i don't mean to cut you off but i want people to understand too that these school safety officers these ssas is what they kind of call them 
are actually represented by Teamsters, Lo Teamsters Local 237, not the PBA. So, you know, I think that kind of goes to your point. Right. I mean, so, so now we're doing slide to the left, slide to the right. And the reason why I bring that up is because most people would not consider that defunding. However, it's been thrown under there as that by the powers to be to give the impression because we're talking about critical thinking, critical reading, and where culture and law meet, you kind of like hide that underneath the carpet, the kind of three card Monty, and you think you're getting something, but you're not really getting something. And my model with all of this, whether it is, you know, Black Lives Matter, whether it is just being a black person in America and just moving along, or a person of color in America, while we're sleeping, they are thinking. And what do I mean by that? Everything that you're going to talk about is one resounding uh, image that goes through my brain. And that is, I do not see Patrick Lynch, the PBA president, either disagreeing, either going to the media saying this is wrong, something that shows that he's being pinched, that is not a dream. And if that is not happening, then that means that this is negotiated and there are negotiations. And while we're sleeping, they're thinking on how to make it seem like it is something more than what is not. And I'm sure after Dr. Grant uh, sets her comment, you'll continue to show that it might be smoke, smoke and mirrors. Very well might be. And it's interesting with the school safety officers, especially for folks in our community, because these school safety officers are really in schools in our community. <laughs> and if they're moving them to the Board of Ed, I'm wondering, are they going to change the training that they have and their approach to their job? Because they have been a police force in school. So that's just one to push the pin in and really see what this reallocation, which is what Royce is hinting at, the reallocation moving to the left, to the right, what it really does for our children, who are the people that occupy these schools whenever we're able to be in those doors again. So I just found that interesting that that would be one of the first places that they reallocated funds. And it's almost, and, 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 and hold on one second, it's almost as if back in the day when New York Transit had their own force and then they became part of New York City Police Department, it's almost as if they, they just do it reverse. Like, all right, now we want to make transit separate. And so therefore now we're defunding. Same concept, same result, same uniform, same training. Yeah, and, and I do want to mention this, uh, and I think it's important to mention this. Um, most of the members, most of those SSAs are actually women, and a good part of them are women of color. I, you know, there was a time when I represented them when I was with a, uh, a firm, and, um, you know, I'm hoping, because hope is eternal, I, I, I'm hoping that with this transformation, other positive transformations can come, because, you know, these are good sisters, so I just I just hope, you know, I wish them the best, I wish, I hope this move can be turned into a positive, is all I'm going to say to that. Um, next, school crossing. And I, and I, hope, I hope they come to you, they need some type of representation, ain't that so? Yeah, I hope so. I'm, I, hope I'm they, I hope they bless me, and I can bless them. Um, <laughs> School crossing guards. Um, oh, Mr. Russell, uh, should I continue? Yeah, yeah. Sure, uh, sure. Yeah. You know, we got the school crossing guards, homeless outreach workers being transferred out of the NYPD budget. That was worth four point forty six point nine million, according to the reports. Uh, so, I mean, I guess I'll just you know move on from there. Um, police academy class of uh 2020 um the new police academy class if you will uh 1163 cadets that was canceled that was worth 85.6 million now let's stop right here now here we go i'm gonna ask that question yeah. again is that funding i mean look we we know that there's been times in the past where, where there weren't a class or the class was a whole thing of stalled into a certain period of time. But to label this and put this up front in, in the results of, or in consequences, or as a result of marching in the street and putting pressure and asking for uh, defunding, to slide that in and say that that's defunding, I think it's a little disingenuous, even though it represents 8.5. 
I just think it's disingenuous. And I just think that sometimes if we call it what it is, we'll be all right with it. Because if you came to the community and said, look, I know you're talking about defunding and we're going to do that. However, we are doing this over here. That's not part of that. We are not, we're not having a class. That's not part of the funding, but we're not having a class because we want to think about how we're going about training the next group of police officers. That gives the transparency. That gives a little like, all right, at least you're being up front with me. But when you slide it under there and you expect me to, you know, absorb it as some type of defunding, then that's where we have a problem. At least that's where I have a problem. And, and keep in mind that, you know, in terms of the NYPD as a whole, you're talking, I think, overall uh, about 58,000 employees, part of which are civilian. And then you got the 34,000 actual patrol officers on the, 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 the streets. And when I say patrol officers, probably including, you know, the, the upper echelon sergeant captain, just what I mean is, you know, cop cops versus, you know, civilian employees. So if you, all you're talking about is a 1,100, or 1,163, you know, I'm not sure if the impact is that great. Um, you're right. Now, next, projected overtime was reduced. Oh, here we go. Yeah, here we go. go. Seven I think the key word in there is projected. So what project Well, wait a minute, wait a minute. The key word for you is projected. The key word for me is overtime. You know what I'm saying? You start, so, you know, we've had this pre-show kind of conversation because you and I, we work together all day and Dr. Grant is out there with cardiac arrest. We always talk about this, right? Hit them in the pocket, right? So when I hear overtime, I got to go like this. That, that makes me feel like that because that might be something that wasn't negotiated or maybe it was, but at least we're hitting terms that, Kind of make me shake when I do on my wallet of um a police officer, you know. But I hear you saying projected, but then and then that makes me not feel that like you know like it's project. You know what I mean? Like projection, you know? Exactly. So how do we know? Because they can still rack up the same amount of overtime. So I don't know how much we can really follow that one. It's and like it's like having potential. It's like he, that person <laughs> has great potential. It sounds good, but like you know, if he get if he goes to bed at four o'clock in the morning and wakes up at three o'clock in the afternoon the next day, I don't know what's the potential. What <laughs> yeah, so you know, I, I think that that one is going to be interesting in terms of monitoring whether they stick to that. Because I would imagine if an emergency of some sort occurs, they're going to be be able to say that well, this is what we thought, but because of this, we had to. Mm -hmm more cops in the street and allocate more overtime, you know, so I could see that one getting, you know, uh, blown off. Um, Five million in new vehicle spending canceled. Yeah. Oh, you know what I'm saying? That's the funding. Wow. Take the vehicle. Yeah. So the five vehicle. million. So, you know, what blows my mind as you're going through these numbers is the amount of money we spend on certain things then we have a homeless situation, right? We have big challenges that are going on in the city, but this is the kind of money that we were spending on vehicles. You don't think we could get cheaper vehicles? But anyway, I digress. Keep going with the budget. You know, but these Ed, are the things. Ed, that Ed, Ed, before you say another word, and we're not killing the messenger, you're just giving us the legal <laughs> That's it. You on our team. You down with us. Nah, nah, listen, I know, I know. And then... And then you're not a CI, you're not a confidential informant. You down with us, but you can give us the news, so we chomping on it. But I, I seriously ask the question again Do we consider that key funding? And when I say we, I mean we as a community. I don't think we as a community consider that defunding. Maybe I'm wrong. I mean, I want the money to go, I want the money to make a dent and I want it to be subtracted, but isn't it adding a subtraction at the same time? You know, confuses me, but. I'll take it for what it is. I want to know well, where he's going, but I'll take it. Well, for what it is. we can take that, Royce, and that five million goes to mental health services that people need in the street. That police officers were trying to be 
judge, jury, executioner, unfortunately, for people, but mental health services is real. And maybe some of that money can go towards resources for people who are committing crimes because of their mental state and capacity. So hmm. well, when you say that, when you say that I can appreciate it. And this is when I say we go back to the transparency. Like this is like a fragment. It's not a full sentence. We're taking money. We're not, we're not going to have vehicles or we're going to not buy new vehicles. But let's finish the sentence. We're not buying new vehicles, and the money from that is going to social workers. So when we receive a 911 call and it's someone that is suffering mental challenges, we can ensure that that social worker can go with a team of police officers or whomever, or maybe go on their own to respond to that, thereby receiving extra pay over time or some other monies that they wouldn't normally receive because they're on call 24 hours for that particular week or that particular day. See, now that's the convers that's the full conversation we want. Not yeah, the- I mean we 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 want conversations about even providing maybe some of these officers with incentives to take certain courses and get certain certifications right. uh, that will allow them to do their uh jobs in a um in a way that you know um the the community finds much more beneficial so i agree so i got this last one and i think it speaks to some of that and i think you might find some delight in it um you got 537 million in capital spending that's being moved from the nypd to 450 million of that to youth recreation centers and 87 million to expanded broadband access in wait 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 wait, 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 wait. So I clap with the youth because I'm clapping with the youth. I like that. I'm giving like like the slow clap. <laughs> Let's do the slow clap again. <laughs> Let's show it on this end. Make them make them make them clap to this. <laughs> the reason why I give the slow clap is because now you're talking about broadband making sure that folks live in NYCHA and the projects, making sure that they can get their internet and get their cable. But I know a dude, now I know a couple of dudes, I'm not going to name their names because you know I'm from the Bronx, would say, well, wait a minute, the police department is funding so we can get internet service? I'm definitely not using my phone now because if I thought it was bugged, now I know I'm not using my computer now because if I thought that was bugged, now I know for sure that there's something in the Kool-Aid. And I don't have any mental issues, and those people don't have any mental issues that would have you believe that they're crazy. But when you have an occupying force, a military force, and you move away from community policing, what is one to think? And all of a sudden, all this comes about when we're taking the feet in the street and we have death to the left and to the right of us, it makes you wonder how you keep from going under. And I ain't saying ha ha ha, you know? <laughs> He's a rapper in his other life. But, but before you go on, I want to shout out our viewers today. Hey, Loria. Hey, Jodia. Hey, Rolanda. Appreciate you being here and being a part of the broadcast. Definitely those of you that are tuning in on all our various platforms, continue to share it out. This is where the legal meets the cultural. So we're really going through this defunding that has happened in New York City, air quotes on what it is and just breaking it down so that you really understand it because a narrative is a narrative and it all depends on who's spinning the narrative, uh, what kind of information you get. So we're able to break it down on this show so that you can understand it because we have a lot of what I call sidewalk attorneys. (laughs) But on this show, we have real attorneys who practice day in and day out, protecting our communities and giving us voice so that we can litigate those situations that are not in our favor. So, hey, was that the end of the budget? Uh, well, though, that, that was the part of the budget that, you know, has been, you know, that that the mayor's office and, and you know, New York City, because the mayor, the, the, the mayor puts out the budget, then it has to be voted on by the New York City Council and the New York City Council speaker, usually it's a negotiation between the speaker and the mayor, and then the speaker has to convince all of his council members to, you know, vote for the budget that was negotiated. So, you know, I know that a lot of people were, you know, rather concerned. They wanted more comprehensive uh, changes, you know, budget-wise, but 
apparently this is what you know um the powers that be claim was the best of both worlds or the compromise that they were able to reach um hopefully next year you know um we can come up with a uh better and more comprehensive package um that you know actually looks like what the people were you know asking for um I think when a lot of people thought about defunding, they were talking about let's either make substantial cuts in the in the force, or um, really make some you know true reforms and as to what the force actually looks like. The the defunding kind of label is very misleading because you've also had people in the community are saying, "Wait a minute, time out." I don't want there not to be any cops in the community because we we need the protection. And so that's not what we're talking about here. What we're talking about here is a transformation in terms of how they deal with us, you know? And, and you know, so I'm not sure if, if, these, if these budget changes uh, really truly uh, speak to that. I mean, both of you have been talking about, well, where's the money going to? Is it going to more social workers? Is it going into the community. I mean, the best part of this was this uh, 450 million that's going to youth recreation centers. You know, I think that's wonderful. You know, I, you know, of course, I would like to see the follow up. What recreation centers? What community? Where, where exactly is it going? Is it going into personnel or is it going into infrastructure, new swimming pool, new basketball courts? Uh, you know, in the age of social distancing, what are we doing? I mean, when I was uh, chief of youth diversion at the Brooklyn DA's office, you know, there were always these discussions about funding, for instance, uh, soccer fields and soccer pitches throughout the city, um, you know, basketball programs and the like. And, you know, and there's a need there. And, and, and that's money that you kind of see immediate effects. You talk about giving young people rides to colleges so that they could see colleges outside of New York City and aspire to go to institutions of higher learning, you know, all of that takes money, you know, takes resources. So, you know, we're going to have to see what happens here, you know, where this money actually goes, you know? And, and, to, your, and to your point, you know, even when I was a DA way back when, because it was way back when, we had this mentoring group called Hoop Brothers, and we worked with Legal Aid. And what we did is, you know, we took what, what the world would consider at-risk students, shit, I was an at-risk student, if you, if you really look back on it, but, uh, you know, took those students, you know, we incorporated reading, playing basketball, mentorship, and legal aid was always looking for funding. And the DA's office wasn't looking for funding. Um, I don't know what they were looking for. That's why probably I left. But I don't know what they were looking for in reference to giving that type of community support, but those are the programs that you're speaking to and so when we talk about defunding, I think what people were, at least what I was thinking of, is more of what you're saying and also not, not having a new class. I actually may want the new class because the new class maybe is bringing a new air to what how policing should be. Uh, they have a new mindset maybe. Um, you know, their families might be uh, more diverse than we imagine. Their schooling and education might be more diverse than we imagine. They may actually live in the community to a degree. What we're talking about is get rid of the old. That's what defunding means. Get rid, of, get rid of defunct, defunct the old. Basically, get them out of here and bring in the new. And that's not happening. Meanwhile, we got the dispersion of the most violent units, violent units out there, which is street crime or street narcotics, now being spread among those that patrol the community and, and try to create a relationship in the community. So now you don't know who you run into. So, you know, this is where we are. We got to keep on fighting and not shadow boxing, you know? Yeah. And I'm, um, and you know, I, one of the things that I'm a little disturbed about is recently I had someone speak to me about how some of the precincts have been barricading themselves. And I was like, what are you talking about and now? I mean, literally, I, I think I drove past the 26th barricade. You can't even drive down the street that's in front of the station. I'm not sure if he can, you can even walk down that sidewalk. I don't know. I mean, you, you know, I, I'm, I'm not sure what's going on. You know, the, 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 the idea of access to the community having access to these precincts 
you know, I, I would imagine that's a huge concern for the community, you know, in terms of being able to go in there and lodge whatever grievances or ask for help. And I see a reverse in that in terms of, you know, that happening physically, literally, you know, seeing it for myself. So, you know, I'm going to take a look at that. Let me tell you one thing, Ed. Gentrification ain't going to allow all that to happen. Gentrification yeah. knocks some of that to the sideline because as our communities become, become more gentrified and more mixed, you better believe, I ain't going to name the name. If they want to walk in that precinct, they walking in that precinct. <laughs> well, that, that's a, a great segue when we're talking about what is happening and maybe that's out of fear. Who knows what it's out of? But there is quite a bit that we have to consider with El Policia oh, and sweet. what is going on. So oh, yeah. this right here is really interesting, Ed. And uh, this is a part of our pre-show discussion, bringing this up and forward because the barricading is one disturbing fact and maybe that was their rebelling because they didn't appreciate the protests that were happening who knows you know i think it's a difficult and i want to honor the fact that this is a difficult time for those in law enforcement who do the right thing every day and they are feeling some kind of way i have family uh, friends and extended family members who are on the job and it's a rough time especially those of color who are processing everything that's happening and knowing what happens internally, because there's racism right inside the police department. So I want to get into those stories of people hanging nooses in lockers of black female officers. But on to this subject, NYPD is in giving critical body cam footage to officials investigating alleged abuse. Hmm. Okay, so, um, so we've been talking on this show about an elected civilian review board right so yeah, the main reason i think that comes up is because we feel possibly that the current which is the ccrb the civilian complaint review board isn't allowed to isn't being allowed to be as effective as it should be in addressing you know abuse by police officers and with this article and let me let me just provide some context real quick the Civilian Complaint Review Board is a 15-member 15, 15 board that the various appointees between the police commissioner, the mayor, and the city council are appointed to this board. And the chair of the CCRB is a gentleman by the name of Reverend Fred uh, Frederick Davey, who I believe is affiliated with, uh, Rivers, with Union Theological, and um, he was appointed by de Blasio back in 2018. And this uh, board basically does about 200 investigations out of from the 7,000 uh, approximate complaints that it gets per year. And so there was a memo that was sent to the CCRB staff dated June 26, 2020, that basically talked about how there have been 1,137 requests for body-worn camera footage um, based on 1,032 complaints. And only 40% of those requests, well, basically 40% of those requests are 90 days old. And, and that number as of June 3rd, 2020, numbers 907. And so basically this article talks about how the NYPD basically isn't responding to these requests and the CCRB needs this footage in order to settle these complaints. And they have like a certain deadline that they have to try to meet. And if they don't meet it within that deadline, then they have to close these investigations. And the footage, you know, it's black and white. Either it happened or it didn't in most cases. And well, it, can I interject? Can I interject for a minute, Ed? Let me interject. Yeah, please, please. So um, I want to make sure I'm careful so everybody understands what I'm saying. Um, part of the disrespect that the CCRB receives is self-generated, right? When you have not shown that you have any bite whatsoever, no one feeds you, so no one's going to comply with you. We already know they don't respect you, so they're not going to comply with you. 
if they don't fear you, fear you, they're not going to comply. So what does the NYPD do? They don't comply, right? So that's number one. Number two, uh, CCRB in, in and of itself, they have to look in the mirror. You can't be stroking the pet one day and then kicking the pet the next day. You're confusing the pet. The pet don't know which way you're going. And they spend plenty of years of stroking and stroking and stroking the NYPD, not having any bite, and not having any teeth in their bite, that now they're moving because other people are moving. That means us and those of the African diaspora are now moving. So now they want to move. And so now NYPD is looking at them like, come on, for real? Like, now you're trying to move? Um, we're not complying. And then on top of that, this whole notion that they cannot complete their investigation based upon the camera footage not being there. And this is the legal. So everybody pay attention and listen to this part. It's called an adverse inference. And what do you mean, adverse inference? That means if you don't give us the footage and we say that the officer stomped so-and-so in the head, Ed in the head or Fred in the head or Bill in the head, and there's footage of it, and you don't give it, give us that footage, then we're going to take the adverse inference. That means that it did happen. So you want the inference that it didn't happen by providing the footage. You don't provide the footage. We're going to take an adverse inference. That means that we're going to take the negative of it and hold it to be true. And that means that you stomp, you kick, you did whatever to Billy in the head. Now, the CCRB took that position and then went on with their punishment and their hearings, then those type of documents will come up. That's what I mean by having teeth in your bite. And therefore, the ECRB, Elected Civil Review Board, which, thank you, I want to give a shout out for those who are having me speak at the rally that they had the other day, or, or Saturday, or a couple of weeks ago, a couple of weeks ago, um, is necessary because... When you're elected, you're going to make sure that you're accountable to your constituents. You know, there's no, I'm going to get my pension, so let me roll over to this job over here and just let me just be quiet. You're going to be responsive or else you're going to get voted out. And I think it's important that you mentioned teeth because, you know, what, what happens with the CCRB is that they recommend discipline, but, you know, it's up to the police commissioner at the end whether to follow that recommendation. And also, um, investigators can't interview the police officer who is allowed to view the footage before that officer gets to view that footage. So, you know, you have like all of these obstacles to clear investigation. Now, what the CCRB is asking for is for direct access to the body worn camera database there, because there's a database that they want direct access to that so they don't have to go to the NYPD and ask for it. They get to look for it themselves. And actually in Washington, San Francisco, and New Orleans, the civilian oversight bodies there have actual uh, direct access. So there's no reason why New York City shouldn't be going in that direction as well. And I want to correct something I said earlier. It's the CCRB has 200 investigators that investigate around 7,000 complaints a year. So I just want to make that clear because I said 200 investigations. I meant 200 investigators. Now, this was, a, this was a memo that was issued to the staff by the Director of Quality Assurance of the CCRB. So this is basically them basically, you know, uh, talking amongst themselves about the current state of things. And it seems like pro- public uh, shout outs to them, investigative reporting, basically finding this internal memo and making it public. And now the public, you know, now see mm -hmm. that, look, listen, you know, this is an issue in terms of access, in terms of implementation, because remember, we had that recent law change where they have to issue or they have to make this footage available in, in shootings or violent incidents. Yeah. Within yeah. You know, listen, you know, with this going on, who's to say that even that is going to be effective because they're not turning it over in the first place, you know, and then even there, that's just the violent incidents. What about the incidents that don't get to that point, but there's still a significant level of conduct and there's a 
complaint that needs to be investigated. So they they got to do better. In fact, the article also talks about how in May, in May of this year, there were 212 requests by the CCRB and only 33 responses. So, you know, you do the math. You know, that that's that's horrible. And they're talking about, oh, well, you know, it, you know, you got the COVID-19 and all that. But, you know, if you having so many problems getting the footage to the CCRB, why don't you just give them direct access? You know, we can talk about maybe a, a certain percentage of the senior level investigators of the CCRB having access to it for whatever privileged reasons. Fine. But give them access. Give them access. That's, you know, we're talking about transparency. You shouldn't be hiding from the public. You know, you got the camera on, you're, you're engaging in official duties. It also talks about, interestingly enough, officers kind of using secret code language to other officers hinting, hey, it's time to turn off the camera and, yeah, we and all we, that. We, so, we don't, we don't you know, that's another issue in terms of the camera being turned off at key moments. We don't need so, to. So, you know, where are we here? Mm -hmm. I mean, TCRB is useless in the street. I mean, you know, what's going to go on in the street is going to go on in the street. And you and I know that. So they're always going to be cold to turn off the cameras and things of that nature. But I think it goes back to, once again, how police view the entity that is investigating them. If you believe that it is a puppet or it is a pawn of the NYPD or you just believe, hey, look, the NYPD gets the last word, so I really don't have to listen, and there's no consequences. I mean, we talk about consequences, right? And we talk about defunding, and we talk about, you know, I know we, we want to talk briefly about hitting them where it hurts, and we talk about OT, overtime hitting police officers where they hurt, or have them give a percentage of their salary if they're fined liable for some type of abuse. All of these things are consequences. And if there isn't any consequences, then there's no need and motivation for me to act or react. And so, once again, you have this history of the CCRB not being able to fulfill their part as far as punishment and as far as consequences. So we're not listening to you and we're not going to listen to you. And maybe some of the funding, if we had an elected the, you know, Civilian Complaint Review Board, uh, ECRB, maybe some of the funding from the quote-unquote defunding can go to that body, and then you could really have some bite in, you know, some really teeth, teeth in your bite, rather, you know, where you can make a difference. And so, once again, I, I think it goes down to the entity that's doing the investigation and what you think about the entity and, you know, there's something, there's some age, ageism going on here too. And I'll just bring this up briefly. Most of the investigators are young. Most of the investigators for CCRB aspire to go to law school. And so they're not there for a long period of time. You know, mm -hmm. they, they, they're, their uh, longevity is very loose because once they get in law school, they're gone. And if you're that young, and this is where the age, ageism come in, if you're that young, if you're 22, 21, 23, maybe you're not really understanding the power that you have or the power that's around you to get to the end of what's going on, to get to the end result of someone being abusive, someone taking advantage of, of communities. And this is just a stopgap before you go on to law school. And the last thing is that, Ed, you talked about, you know, giving over footage which we heard much to do uh, with the mayor within 30 days of its violent. Well, that's, you know, you talked about codes. So let's put codes and let's put the requirement to give things over in 30 days and let's put it together. The code is, is don't be violent. Therefore, you don't have to give it over in 30 days, but you can be abusive and still get away. And that's what I mean by redrawing the line. No longer are we going to look for the black eyes and the broken eardrums and, and the death. We're going to start with, why are you knocking on my door that way? Why are you speaking to me that way? Why are you acting that way in front of my children? Why are you treating me the way that you want to treat me when I called you to my home to resolve a situation? That's redrawing the line. And we want that footage as well because that's abusive. Might be verbal, nonviolent, but it's still abusive. 
And who's to say when I grab your arm and I push you into a corner, that's not warrant, that doesn't warrant a camera review or for the camera to be on. So there's a lot in there. Yeah, but, absolutely. I mean, uh, go ahead, Dr. Grant. It, it definitely is. I'm just, you know, as we're showing the audience the article, I see that they asked for a comment from Reverend Davey, and he said that he agrees that investigators should have direct access, that the board and the staff have long believed there should be unfettered access to body-worn camera footage, and he shares the concern about the backlog. So I wonder, with him adding his voice, what the final will be, since he was appointed by the mayor, and you know, we see that in recent weeks with the influx of police misconduct, as he said, allegations, direct access is a necessary tool for the CCRB to fairly and impartially investigate these matters as efficiently as possible. So given what we've just said, do we feel like they have the capacity to do that? Well, yeah. given, given what I just heard, I'm wondering why was he whispering this whole time? How, how come he finally found the voice? Whether it's him, whether it is him, or whether it was somebody sitting in his seat. Why all of a sudden we got these voices now? Now all of a sudden laryngitis is over. You know, <laughs> is, is is second foot. You know, now all this rah, 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 right, right, right. And we know that you could have voiced that a long time ago. That could have been on the plate of any council person, any borough, any uh, borough president, any uh, uh, adv advocate, you know. Why are we, you know, what took so long to get to this spot so you could do your job effectively and efficiently? And, and, and that's where we get to this uh, issue of independence, uh, people not being hamstrung in terms of their commentary and opinion as to the efficacy of that board and its mission. Um, you know, so when you mentioned uh, uh, an elected civilian complaint review board, that was, to me, that was a huge I mean, even still, though, there seems to be opportunities here for reform, even within the current body. And, you know, um, I, I can easily see a bill being uh, drafted out of this that makes the, 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 the compliance with the request mandatory within a certain amount of time or even the granting of direct access, granting more power to enforce the CCRB's recommendation. Um, and maybe even if you do have some appointments, at least some of them be elected or some of them, you know, have, have just more um, independence. Cause I'm not, you know, I haven't done a, a thorough forensic look at the terms of these CCRB members, how long the term is, what the, um, what, whether they can be removed unilaterally, you know what what the, you know what the what, what the rules are uh, for that. But yeah, I was certainly concerned that it, it was only because I haven't seen anything. Um, so I, I was certainly previous to this. So I'm, I, I was also very concerned that this is the first time that you know the uh, that the chair has uh spoken about this you know in terms of the request i suspected that that was what was going on and i don't understand why these requests aren't being complied with i mean we in any of our criminal cases with our clients that there's body worn camera footage we get that as part of the discovery so yeah, uh, 15 days now right yeah so um, i don't understand what the delay is here it's it's there it's available hand it over. I mean, I, I see that there seems to be some issue in terms of the officer getting to look at that first, but you know, that needs to be uh, fixed. That officer needs to hurry up then and look at that footage. You know, well, sure. why, hey, look, why, why does he need to look at the damn footage when he was part of the incident? You know what I'm saying? That's like, you know, I, look, I know I dunked the ball. I might want to look at the footage and see how well I dunked it, but I don't think I know what I did. I was there. I was in the moment. So why am I only reason why I'm looking at it is so I can give commentary as to what took place or the rationalize what happened and why I did those actions. But the footage is what I call a long, long time ago. Stubborn evidence It's going to stay the same. It ain't going to change. It's going to be the same no matter what it is, unless you take it to the editing board. And I also want to give a shout out 
to the persons of the churches that dropped that memo to the news outlet because it just didn't get there by itself. So kudos to that person or person that decided they're going to take their moment in time to do the right thing. And if you're watching, you know, kudos to you. Hey, well, hey guys. Oh, go I'm ahead. I got something fun I want to share on a cultural level, actually. You know, I, like I've said on this show many times, I'm a proud Dominican-American attorney, you know, born and raised in New York City. Both of my parents are from the Dominican Republic. A few years ago, I was able to get a uh, dual citizenship, and I actually voted in my first Dominican election this past Sunday, nah, actually. Nah. And uh, this, this was a special election because Apparently, people are in a real uproar with the uh, incumbent government uh, right now, and some older Dominican folks who had never voted in their lifetimes voted this Sunday because they wanted uh, reform. You know, I'm not going to reveal who I voted for, but, um, you know, secret ballot consistent with that. But certainly there was a lot of energy. I had to wait like about an hour and some change on the line because so many people wanted to vote and and. And it was just an amazing, amazing um, experience. So I just wanted to shout out to my Dominican, a mi gente, voté por la primera vez en una elección dominicana para la presidencia y el deputado deputado. So, you know, so estoy orgulloso de ser dominicano en este momento. I think, you bueno. know, I think you're going to get a free haircut for that when you stop by. Because <laughs> I think folks are going to recognize with my mask on, right? You know what I mean? With your mask on, here you go. Let's cut him up right because he went back home to do the right thing. But we know it's challenging to get folks to the polls. And hopefully in this movement, which is going to be more of a movement and not a moment, folks will look at the local level and go to the polls more often than not. And, you know, keep an eye on the national, but understand the local is, is, mm -hmm. is going to affect you more than anything else. And that's important. Absolutely. Absolutely. And one of the things that I was going to say when we talk about the shout out, Royce, that you gave to whoever leaked it or shared it with the news. Share. We're in we, like the word, we like the word share, share. Share. Okay. Share. Not like leak, share. Leak, leak means something, you know, we shared it, shared it. Transparent. <laughs> transparent. Like I was well, share my skittles, right? <laughs> but, easy. Easy. As, <laughs> as we talk about the sharing of information. We're living in a time where everybody is exposing everything. So when we talk about the legal meeting, the cultural, everybody's empowered to be able to share data, share information. So people are tense because they don't know what's coming out. And right now, the climate is lending itself to people finding a voice and being able to share what they feel has been an injustice or where they didn't feel comfortable before they're sharing it now so just a community if you know something what, what's the little tag that goes on transit if you see something say something well we're at a point now where everybody needs to be saying something that is going to move us to true reform and to really get to a place in this country not just in the city that we really can have equity across the board and access and opportunity and you know what like the man said, Mookie, do the right thing. Right. And, I'll, right thing. and I'll even you do the right thing in the first place. You don't got to worry about some camera catching you doing the wrong thing. That's right. And I'll add on to not only see something, say something, and Mookie do the right thing, but I will tell you something. You better read something before you need something. So go get yourself a copy of Cardiac Arrest, a tactical guide on how to handle unlawful police stops because. Reading is fundamental, all right? Sure. And don't get caught in the moment and say you don't know what you should have did or what was going on. I should have done this. I should have done this. What was I supposed to do? And also understand, since we're talking about camera and footage, that means we have to be our own protectors. And that means we have to take our own footage. Not speak over our footage, but take our own footage. Not alert them that we're taking footage, but... Take the footage, not be right in front of their face when you put on your, put on the camera or the cell phone, but step back 20 <laughs> feet and take the footage because that's making a difference. You know, that's better sometimes than making a call. It will help people like Ed and I pursue and litigate for your case if you're a victim of a forced arrest or police brutality. 
Exactly. And it is what is needed in order for, as you can see, the CCRB to move forward. So do your own Spike Lee and take your own footage. Exactly. But you can't do it like this. Like, I'm taping you. I'm taping you. I'm taping no, you. No, no, you can't do it. And you can't be how it comes out. Oh, my God. Look at him. He's getting his head knocked out. No. <laughs> Let the footage speak for itself. But hey, I mean, I mean, I, I got to give that young woman props. Uh, that film, that George Floyd incident. Again, she's a real hero. That's right. That's she's right. a hero. God bless her. You know, yeah. she's only a teenager, right? I don't think she even graduated from high school yet. That's correct. She's you one of the hero all the way. Very you know? brave. All Very way. brave. And to think that that child was getting death threats, you know, is just it breaks my heart because she's a champion and she's a hero for yeah. doing what she did. So we also, you know, keep her and her family in our thoughts and prayers because can you can you imagine that's your child? And people are threatening your child for just filming the truth. And so but, it means layers to it. But we well, also well, folks, speaking of prayers, have you heard about the uh six activists from Ferguson, Missouri, that all young black males that have been killed in the years since that killing of Michael Brown? Maybe we could save that for the next show. Um, some people are calling well, for an investigation into that. Two of them, I believe, have been sh were found shot and burned in vehicles, and two of the other four uh, reports of suicide and, and I, I can't remember what happened to the uh, the, rema the remaining two out of those six. But uh, but I'll, I'll we'll, we'll talk about that and I'll share that story with you. Um, you know, it's it's a very disturbing. Uh, uh, in uh, piece of news that I read about recently, Roland Martin reported on it. Actually, we want to make sure that we talk about that, and we also want to talk about what we call hitting them in the pocket, right? And uh, matter of fact, I'll spend two seconds on it now. We all we oftentimes talk about hitting police in the pocket financially, and some of the things that we, at least I've advocated, maybe there needs to be a law that talks about taking a certain percentage of salary if the city has to settle or if they're found liable for a fourth arrest, police brutality. Um, some of the comments that we received on air here is trying to go after their pension. And just briefly, without getting into the details, we know that the pensions are protected to a degree. And so the likelihood of that becoming a reality will have to take reform. And so if you're looking to uh, do something, put the pen to the paper, start drafting legislation to try to see if that is something that is worthy going after. But as it stands now, um, it is protected. And we and don't- we, to, yeah, I'm yeah. sorry, we could kind of talk about, you know, that and the law that passed back in uh, 2011 regarding the uh, state pension system and, you know, uh, the, the, the a felony allowing the district attorney in, in the case that a public official enters a, a plea to a felony or is found guilty of a felony after a trial and the district attorney's ability or the AG to ask for uh, that pension to be re reduced or completely removed. But, you know, it only affects uh, public officials that enter the pension system after 2011. We'll talk about that, maybe some more, Royce, uh, Dr. Well, Brown, that's, that's, important. That's, that's important because now having, uh, from my understanding, if if you're convicted of having someone in a choke holding your police officer, that's supposed to be a C felony now, right? And so now, you know, you're gonna see cases of that nature definitely going to trial because most of the time, what officers are worried about is the pension. And if they're able to secure their pension, then sometimes life is good because remember we're talking about officers that have been on the force longer than shorter so they have more to lose and if that is in place and i'm doing no jail time i'm doing 400 hours of community service then you know somebody will say sign me up and keep it moving and we've seen that in the past and if i have a bench trial where there's a possibility that i get away free i definitely roll the dice on that so, well, yeah, to be continued, and you mentioned writing or putting pen to paper, but that 
That's really talking to your elected officials. That's what they're in office for, to be able to draft legislation that we can talk about issues like this. So that's something for all of you watching and continuously getting ideas on what you can do as members of your community to raise the conversation to a level of action. That's something that you can talk with your elected officials. What's their stance? What do they see as a possible or probable solution to